Good morning. Good morning. Coffee done. I should be in good shape. <laughs> Are you a coffee person? I am, but I've cut way down. I only have one cup in the morning at home. That's typically what I do. Well, I don't have it at home. I have it on my way. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm on on time and I have everything working. <laughs> You're on early. Well, I've been so late so many times, I figured I better really get at it early. <laughs> I like the I like your background. Oh, yeah, I love it. I, I feel like it, I've used this for almost a year now, so I feel like I need to get go out and take some pictures and get a new background. Well, I didn't notice it before, but it looks great. Well, thank you. So, yeah, sometimes it's just the clutter of my office. I figure this is about <laughs> You know. Well, that's when you're trying to show people you're overworked and you're not paid enough, right? And say, oh, man, look at my office. You that or I'm a slob. <laughs> Maybe a combination. Or you show them this one. It's like, well, I'm so lucky to work here. I don't need to do that. <laughs> The first time I used this, somebody said, you look like a newscaster. <laughs> <laughs> you know how they have, like, they're in front of the cast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the green screen. Well, and, and we're old enough that we still watch newscasters. Right. <laughs> That's Janet, right? Yep. Oh, you haven't met Janet? No, no, I just mean that. That's her coming in. I she didn't have any sound yet. Oh, okay. if we don't have more people on yet. Well, I'll go grab my cup of coffee then. Sorry about that. Hello. Morning. Hello. Hello. Hey, Ken. Ken, I saw you walking the other day with oh, those two bulldogs. Those, that was that. Was that you? You have Who? two two bulldogs. Who are you talking to? You. Damn it. Oh, me, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said Ken. No, <laughs> Janet. No, uh, no, yes, Andrew, I do. I you have do? I, I thought it was you. A black and white and a fawn and white. Okay. Yeah. I think I've seen your husband walking them before. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen you walking those dogs. He, well, he's retired, so he does most of the dog walking. <laughs> and it, it takes, it takes quite a while to get them moving. <laughs> <laughs> They're not a breed with a whole lot of energy. You're talking about the dogs, not your husband, right? Uh, both. I think um, it looks like Jim might be in there as an attendee. I see. I recognize his. That's his. Okay, his so number with phone numbers, I just have to click allow to talk because it doesn't allow the panelists to to participate by phone. So I just unmuted him. So he should be able to unmute himself when he wants to talk. And and Jim, if if that's you and you're on the phone, if you do wish to talk. Press star six to unmute. Okay, there's Mary Lou. Is that you, Jim? Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Jim Barr. Okay. Hey, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for unmuting me. Were, were my technical instructions correct? They were perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I always worry because <laughs> I, I know just enough to be dangerous. 
<laughs> the um, yeah, okay, he's. I think Earl had confirmed he would be able to join, but I, he's not in the attendees yet. You know, so Earl, let, me, let me just. I just got me, a, <clears throat> Andrew. I just got a text from Earl, and I, he asked me to send him um, the package. The and yeah, I'm not quite sure I'm able to do that now that I'm. Okay, let me. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get the agenda and send him a link. Yeah, that's what he, yeah, that'd be great, thanks. I almost sent him a link to the planning commission, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Jim has to pop off around 1030. So I, I think in res respect to the agenda order, if it's okay, if we could maybe move the, um, the capital projects toward the end. Um, Cause I think, you know, I, I, would, I would value getting Jim's input on some of the other areas um, for purposes of time, if that's okay. I think we're missing Bonnie too. Do you know? Do you know if she's able to join? She didn't say she wasn't. Let me check her. Ellen Lurie, Hi. I wanted to thank you for all those documents over a few days earlier because it sometimes if I get them too quickly I, I just can't I don't have the time to review them absolutely but gave me ample time to review them thank you absolutely sure I didn't want to send them over the weekend and give you something to do then <laughs> I just sent Bonnie a text, and you you, you, you gone ahead and sent Earl an email, Emory. Yep. Okay. Yep. I just hit send. Yeah, Bonnie has to join. This is her. This is probably her last finance committee meeting. I'd I'd imagine before she rides off into the sunset. <laughs> She probably thinks we're giving her a cake. <laughs> a virtual cake. Do we have sunset rules on these committees? By the way, I meant to ask that before. Uh, I, I don't believe so. Yeah. What do you mean sunset? You you can't serve beyond a certain number of years. Yeah, no. Darn. Are you you're I looking mean, for an out, Ken? You're you're, you're certainly <laughs> welcome to let the mayor know you don't want to be reappointed. I, I was just thinking I started, not accepting I started your resignation. <laughs> well, that's a good point because we we also will have obviously a new council person to take Bonnie's spot as well. So there will probably be some reconfiguration, at least in that respect. Yeah, because finance is a tricky one. Other, other things I've been on boards of and all that, there's, there's usually some kind of restrictions on how long the same people can manage finance. Oh, there's Earl. Okay. Well, once we get Earl, why don't we go ahead and get started? Because as I said, Jim, Jim's got to, he's got to go to work today, apparently. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's it, yeah. <clears throat> My son's putting me to work today. Okay. I got um, so, yeah, no worries. I appreciate the fact that you're able to join. Um, so why don't we call the meeting to order? As ho hopefully Bonnie can join at some, at some point uh, before we get started into the agenda itself. But I think the first item uh, 
is a presentation and, and possible action the approval of minutes and uh yeah i don't think there were any minutes i think i actually just got an email from janine stating that i don't think she's had the chance to even add those so um despite the fact that it was on the agenda there's really nothing to to action there so we had nothing to review um so if it's okay el lorraine or amory if you're if you're okay to take us through the um, C1, the financial statements and the, and the current budget, um, I assume either feel free to share your screen if you want, but I think as already stated, there was a, a packet sent around, but if maybe for the benefit of people on the call, um, if you want to share your screen, you can, I think. So I'm going to defer to our expert, um, Ellen Lorraine McCabe. Oh. Um. <laughs> so I'll um, talk about a little bit about the finances and the budget and Amory, if I forget something or you want to add something, feel free to jump in. So yeah, on the call, we could just go off ours. Trina, um, I see you're on there. There's there's a link in the agenda to the pack to the um, sort of exhibits, if you will, that Ellen Lorraine's going to take us through. So rather than sharing screen, we can you can go off of the hyperlinks in the agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, so attached to C1 um, is the January monthly financial report that gets presented to council along with the February financial report. And um, both of these documents were used to help in the budget process. We have just completed March and the January and February theme long ago. Um, but that information that we are seeing just preliminarily looking at March strengthens the city's finances to say that we are uh, still trending with a surplus in FY21, which is what we were anticipating when we worked on the budget. Um, some of the items that we have looked at that are higher, coming in higher than budget are gross receipt rental tax, um, the City dock rentals and marina rentals are higher than budget. Also, the business licenses are coming in higher and building permits is coming in higher than budget. There are- marine. A question on the marine piece, since there's this fixed number of, sli of slips, what, what, do, what do you attribute the growth there on? I think it's the transient slip rentals. Okay, great. Increasing, so we budgeted eight thousand, and as of today, we are at one hundred fifteen thousand uh, for revenue at the end of March. There were minimal lines, significantly lower than budget, and talking the amended budget. The adopted budget, the adopted budget revenues were six. 0.377 and then the budget was six points. So as it stands as of right now, our revenues for March and for the fiscal year end are in excess of 165 per over the amended budget. Expense wise, expenditures are down. 60,000, which means we are having a surplus, but these are um, unaudited figures. If we move on to the budget, everyone should have received the FY22 budget cover letter that um, came at the recommendation of the council for a couple years ago. And I think it's been a very useful tool and recommendation that she had that we've tried to include in each subsequent budget. Um, it details what has been incorporated into the budget and um, how we arrived at some of the budgeted figures. Well, let me pull that. Does everyone have that budget letter? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you look at page one, it said in the FY22 budget, the tax rate remained the same. It was 57 cents per $100 of the assessed value. The city does tax at half the assessed value. Uh, we've not increased that tax rate since uh, 
2011. We did not make any changes to business license fees. We did not change any parking meter rates. Um, there were a number of employees received a 1.3% uh, COLA increase, a one-time bonus. Um, moving on to page two, the budget, um, some of the items in the collective bargaining agreement. There were no increases in health care premiums. Um, I'm just trying to flip through this. There were a number of uh, capital projects that the city included in the general fund budget as well fund budget and we could get into more of those items. So in total, the budget for FY22 is 9.566 million. And this is for all city funds, not just the operating fund, but all city funds. That is an increase of 3% over the adopted budget for FY21. And I think the other attachment we have are UBS statements. Before uh, we move on, is there, were there any questions from the committee on the anything you saw on the letter or um, the year? Because as we're approaching the end of the year, any questions around the how the revenues came in or comments? Can I just add a, a, a couple of things that we, we discussed at, as we went through the budget? Um, you know, so we are pulling for the operating budget, we are pulling from reserves. And um, I, I just want to be clear that this was not something that Ellen Lorraine or I or mayor and council took lightly. Um, we believe one, um, we've been very conservative on the, the revenue estimates because you know we're still in the pandemic um we all of our revenues um you know i took a quick look at some of the ones we we were keeping a close eye on yesterday um you know after things were closing out and everything came in most things i should say came in higher than the original projection not even when you account for we adjusted the budget downward based on, on COVID. So um, we are still being conservative because we, we know that the tourism industry is very volatile to the, the COVID, but um, we believe one, we end up transferring money to reserves every year. So um, we have very healthy reserves in our operating fund. And two, it's likely that the transfer will be less based on the actual revenues that, that we see. We just thought it was more important to be conservative because if, if we over project revenues, then it puts us in a hole. Um, so we tried to be conservative on the revenue projections because there are unknowns. So. Um, Anne-Marie, can I ask you for a clarification of something you just said? Sure. Sorry about that. Um, am I understanding what you, for what you had to say was that during the course of the pandemic, you adjusted budget numbers, the revenue figures downwards, um, and then they came in higher, but did they come in higher to what we had projected pre-pandemic? Some of the line items did. The, um, the I'm trying to think. The gross receipts rental. Um, look, I'm, and, and it's not going to show in your February report because some of the stuff was um, posted um, in March. But the gross receipts, rental tax, and the building permits were the ones that we were watching very closely. So the amended budget had a GRRT of 520. I think, what was the original budget, Ellen Lorraine, do you remember? 
550. 550, and we were at like 576 as of 576. Right. See what wow. I'm um, wow. And then our building permits, I think our original budget was at um, 450. At 450, and the adjusted budget was, did we? Back it down to 400 or to 360? See? Pardon? 360. And we were over 400. I can't remember the exact. Got it. Okay, so Mary, to, to Anne Marie's point, we, we debated increasing the, the GRT in the over and over. And we, we did bump it up once, but we, we still kept it fairly conservative for the gross receipts rental tax, right. what we're budgeting this year. But trending wise, it looked it, pretty healthy. Right. It looked pretty good. Okay. So the, the ones that, that did come in a little under the um, the oh gosh the mercantile licenses can't look like they're gonna come in above what we the original or the amended projection but not quite where we were the prior year. Okay. Okay. So uh, just for yuck's sake, is the the revenue from the gross rental um, in the budget going forward, is it at the pre are, are you budgeting at the pre-pandemic level? Are you budgeting at the amended um, pro projection? Where, wh what's the number you put in for that? Yeah, going forward. I'm sorry, the, the same number, the five? 550. 550, got it, thank you. And again, it, at the time when we were looking at it, that was closer to reality. Um, yeah, I, think I understand. We had some come in in March that, you know, again, I think it, it was higher than we thought. So, good. Thank you. Can I just add that the uh, we're drawing from prior year reserves, we are surplus in FY21 that will reduce the draw. Right, so we anticipate um, what by the time we like close everything out, the, the, the excess revenue over expenditures this year will be over 300,000. Again, we're still trying to be conservative while we wait mm -hmm. to see how it all shakes out. So um, it'll offset a big portion of that potential okay. transfer. Uh, I had one more question. I think I think Anne Marie, um, I've raised this a million times, and I think you were going to look into um, the possibility of um, the yellow uh, line on the curbs where it's no parking. Particularly, it's confusing a number of places, but I think it's really unsafe, particularly on outbound um, Kings Highway and on the town side of Fourth, where the sidewalk immediately abuts the street. A yellow, a yellow line really helps differentiate for the cars going through there. So they did expand it. I, I guess they didn't expand it as much. I, I will, I, I talked to them about that last year. I know that they expanded it in some areas. So let me follow up with you by email. Okay. I think it, it really, on, on Kings Highway, it really needs to go to the train tracks because there's, okay. there's a bunch of stuff there where it's confusing for people. There's a lot of bike traffic and all. And here on 4th Street, 4th okay. Street's pretty narrow and the sidewalk is right up against the road. And it's the only, it's only that side of the street where there's no parking. So cars really come roaring through there sometimes. Yep. Okay. And then there it would only have to go to uh, uh, the, where the, where the road jogs there by the old church building. Okay. They did expand some, uh, let me look and see. Um, they probably just didn't expand it all. Thanks. I'll follow up on that. Thank you. Ani's going to log on now. I just got a message from her. She, I think she may have thought it was at 10. Then she's early. She's getting senioritis. Like she's she's getting <laughs> yeah, right. She's getting <laughs> that kind of free-spirited sense about her. Don't say senioritis in Lewis. It means a different thing. I, I was thinking more like a senior in high school or college. Sure you were. Were there any any other comments on the the budget or the revenues, et cetera, um, before we move on? We will talk, part of this meeting, we'll talk about 
revenue specifically, um, but I don't know if anyone wanted to make any more comments on the, the budget. And I agree. I think the budget letter itself is very helpful um, to, you know, sort of summarize um, where we where where we are, where we've been, and sort of where we're going. So I, I appreciate that letter and Eleanor and putting that together. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I hung down for like two o'clock. My mistake. No worries. We we um we just went over the the budget the budget letter and the um the monthly report. Uh, body Fortunately, for your, I know those. You, things. you have exactly. You're well versed in. <laughs> you, <laughs> My timing yeah. is perfect. Yeah. So that takes us on. As I said, I think for Jim's benefit, um, in terms of order of sort of input, I'd like to get it. Um, we could move capital projects maybe toward the end and then just continue next with C three. Um, uh, the drafting of the policy statements. And today, you know, I thought I kind of just teed it up last time in a sense that I think we just want to start by getting a framework of, you know, what sh should we be including in these policies from a broad sense? Um, so I was hoping that people came maybe with ideas or examples of, that they may have used in other places um, just to maybe get us started. I had well, first of all, maybe Ellen, Lorraine, and Anne Marie could get us start on what they think maybe, you know, the buckets that we might want to include. But I had shared something, maybe my understanding around, um, you know, I thought maybe balance, ha having a statement around the need for the balanced budget, um, having a statement which I think we have around a general fund reserves. I think there may be an existing investment policy statement. Uh, maybe something around the city's obligations from a service level, um, both you know the standards that they need to meet for the community, but also their their filing obligations in terms of um, you know audits, et cetera, and then making that would also be bucketed in terms of any retirement or pension contributions. Um, and then may, the other one I, you know, is what they're going through now is like kind of the auditing or, or meeting financial reporting. Um, from whatever government entity uh, is required. So I thought, you know, those are five or six broad buckets that we may consider having statements on. I don't know if there were, if I'm missing the mark or if there were other areas that we should have. And, and again, the benefit for this, I think is twofold. This one's the transparency to the citizens, but, you know, I think Rob and I have talked about the benefit of council people understanding, like Anne, Ellen and Lorraine every year has to explain like, you know, why do you have to keep this much in a in a general reserve, or why do you have to allocate the general uh, the gross receipts rental tax to these uh, pots of money and, and not others? So I think it's kind of that idea of you know why do we need these statements is, is both for the public but also for the instruction of future council people and et cetera. Can I can I speak to that as a soon to be former council person? Uh, went through the learning curve. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, on the need for balanced budgets, that's that's a constitutional requirement. So I don't think we need a statement on that. Um, the only financial statement that I am aware of um, is the investment policy, which Ken and Ellen Lorraine will remember. Um, we updated an existing one several years ago. Um, that may that that should always be looked at you know, every couple of years uh, because the investing environment now is probably very different than when we get in there. I mean, I think that the conservative nature of investing taxpayer funds doesn't change, but the vehicles or the allocations uh, may. So, um, but the, the other things, you know, explaining to people why we, why our finance, why our budget looks the way it does in terms of the all important, you know, reserves and that sort of thing. I, I think, I think that's a good idea um, to, to let people understand what's going on. Yeah. I, I, I was think, hoping I, to, go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, I think if we, when, when we look at it as policies, we think we tend to get tangled up on it because generally what we're calling policies don't really have any teeth in them. I mean, it's not like the council can't override all of it anyway. I think we might we might do better to think about this stuff as guidelines. You know, here are here are the guidelines we have followed. We suggest you know strongly that they be followed this way in the future. Variants from these should be done very carefully. You know, something to make the public feel better 
and to just remind future culture members that these are the things that were looked at before. A lot of these things may have changed, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that that's kind of my point is I think we, if we could just button down like what areas need definition because in, in my mind we're already practicing these things so it's really around okay what do we want to highlight as a policy or a practice etc and then you know myself working with Ellen Lorraine and Anne Reed just you know contextualizing that and taking what is a practice and and putting into some sort of document form because I think you know to, in most cases we're we already are doing a lot of these things. It just needs to be articulated. Almost, almost like the cover letter to the budget, where where it would be, you know, a series of bullets on these are kind of core uh, approaches and principles we have taken and would expect to continue to take. Yeah. So, yeah, think Bonnie's point around the balanced budget—that's statutory, but I think you know it may be worth just again just uh, verbalizing that for the public, just uh, letting for those that you know. It's required. You have to have a, a balanced budget. So that's a state, maybe a statement. Um, um, what about the idea that I put that you know again? It's more of a statement, but that at the end of the day, um, it's the public service levels that need to be met. Is that part of what we should make as a statement or a policy that the revenues and its our budgets are set really to meet the needs of the citizens? Is that worth stating? Or is it obvious? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, the pur the purpose of the budget is to you know fund the proper operation of, of the government, and you can say something like that, I guess. I, mean, I, I think it's good. important. I think it's important to follow certain policies, like the investment policy, um, and and that. I have a question about that, and I guess I'm the new guy, but um, the last UBS statement, I think that for the summary page on for all investments indicated that we had 90% um, of our um, funds in fixed income, either mutual funds or investments. And the policy um, says it should be up to 80%. So I was just wondering, am I missing something or is um, is that policy just a guideline? Can I can I speak to that? I think I can answer that question. Um, there, there, there are two big pots of money with UBS. One, which it's around, you guys correct me, around $2 million or so. I haven't looked at those statements in a while, but those are the city's reserve funds, the true rainy day funds. Um, which we have in, uh, in, in absolutely safe investments, trying to eke out a tad bit more return. Um, and I think that skews um, the overall portfolio. Um, I, the, invest, the investment policy was actually, I think, more designed towards the other pot of money where we, um, we put our excess revenues. Um, so that, that could be part of the problem. I don't know, Ellen Lorraine, does that make sense? I'm trying to look at it now. Um, the, While Ellen Lorraine's looking, when, when we put this together, it was as we moved from um, a no return investment policy where we were 100% um, secure and the view was that we could do better than that and still be very safe and that we would um, kind of start with baby steps and make sure everyone became comfortable with, with how we were proceeding. So as we gradually become more comfortable, we can certainly look at tweaking some of those percentages, but it was it was intentionally put together as, as extraordinarily conservative. Yes, it was. Yeah, and, that, and that's why I'm certainly not arguing the fact and if but but I'm just saying the policy. If if we are going to have a policy and it says that, um, it's a little it's a little confusing when you look at the summary page of the UBS and they have the pie graph and it shows, you know, ninety percent of your investments are in fixed income and and the policy statement says no more than eighty. Um, okay. Minor detail, but you know, it, it, it if it isn't a policy to be followed, it's 
just a question that I have. So let me um, clarify something as well. Um, I think we're talking about two separate documents. One is the investment policy statement, which would dictate a parameter, so to speak, for the portfolio. The other is something that I don't think we have at this point, which is the fi financial, and Ken, I'm gonna borrow your statement, financial guidelines, which would address things such as having nothing necessarily to do with the investment side, but would have things along the lines of, for example, when our, um, our bonding requirements, when we fulfilled and paid off our bonding, what are we going to do with those excess funds? That would be an example. Or um, you know, balancing the budget. Some of the things, Bonnie, you've talked about over many meetings, trying to um, essentially memorialize generalized guidelines that would dictate in the, um, for, for the finances of the city. So I envision these as two very separate documents, the IPS, the investment policy statement, versus the financial guidelines policy, which I think we're starting at scratch, correct? Like none of that's been memorialized in a financial guidelines document? Right, yeah. and, and that's one of our priorities for the coming year. Well, okay. One other policy that I, I think we need to memorialize and, and the basis is in the, the charter, and I think it goes more toward the financial guidelines is the um, purchasing. The, the purchasing policy specifies that if something's over $25,000, and it's goods or if anything other than professional services, it needs to be done by sealed bid. But it doesn't tell you how you do any anything below that. And most um, municipalities will have kind of a, a tiered system that would be under the the umbrella of the the twenty five thousand. But then how do you deal with professional services that aren't under that requirement of the charter? And how do you deal with the, the 10 to $25,000 purchases? You know, do, do you just go to, you know, I know in the state policy, and again, their thresholds are different. Um, if, it, if it's below the sealed bid amount, you still have to get free quotes. You know, it just, it, it adds that level of transparency. And we try to do those things, but we don't have a policy to prescribe. Anne-Marie, do you have any, um, do you, are you aware of any other municipalities set of documents that we might use as a template? Yes, yeah, so we have gotten documents from um, Milford, Dover, and I think Elm Rain, Sussex County. Yes. So we, we have a series of, of documents that, that we can use as a template. This is one of the things that when we, when we get our next management fellow, we were gonna have that person start to develop some drafts that we would then share with Andrew as the treasurer and, and could be obviously run through um, the finance committee before they would become finalized. Yeah, I think it's it's important to, to, to note that in the absence of, of a lot of these policies and things, it all really falls on Andrew, which is kind of an unreasonable level of expectations where we, even, even where we have a finance policy on investments, there's nothing there saying who really affects this, how will they be notified? Like if the if the uh, percentages get out of whack as to what the policy says, does that mean we have directed Andrew to go forward and sell some equities or sell some bonds? Or, you know what what needs to happen? How how are we how are we individually or as a group to make those things happen? Remember, this committee itself is solely advisory, but we have people on it that have um, you know statutory responsibilities. And and what what decisions can be made administratively by staff or by staff in, in consultation with the treasurer or those that need council approval and and 
that for those that need council approval, which should require a recommendation from the finance committee. I mean, I think that there are kind of different ways to piece that together. So I, I, I do think that in looking at the, the various municipal county policies that, that we, you know, have as kind of templates, um, we can start to put together something, you know, a, a compendium of policies that, that the finance committee could react to. You know, and, and some of those things, um, I know that there's been discussion of making sure everything's on the website. Some policies would be on the website. Some may be more internal, like what, one of the policies that we've actually started developing is our cash handling policy and, and how we deal with with that, and that's more a um, you know it, internal control issue. Those types of things may be available upon request, but sometimes if you put too much information out to the public on the website, it almost confuses them as to what things are the, the things that they should care about versus what they you know it, it, how, how much of it is, is more operational. Thanks for addressing that. So let's endeavor to do this is since we have, you know, we, we have some good starting points and it sounds like there's um, beyond the Sussex County one I was aware of, it sounds like we have some examples from some municipalities. So let's endeavor to have a draft, um, you know, at least outlining before next finance committee meeting. I can, I'm happy to, if you want to send along the drafts of what you've got now from the other municipalities, I can assist with that as well. Um, uh, the next one would then be um, the idea that we talked about last time too, which is an, an inventory and asset management kind of tracking system, if you will. And, and Anne-Marie, do you want to touch on that? It sounds like we, we may, you know, between the auditing and, and what we have maybe as part of our software package, we, we might be... be down that road a little ways anyway. So we can build something to build off of anyway. Yeah, so we, we've got our um, asset listing that we, we have from the auditor that um, we would use as a basis. We also have the new um, street assessment, which, you know, streets being assets as well, we, we can start to look at um, the GMB did for us. So the, the, we have in our admin software, which is our, you know, what I would call like the municipal brain. It, it has your accounting and your licensing and permitting and, you know, it, it's, um, it's basically the brain behind. It, it makes sure it, it's all of our record keeping or most of our record keeping. So, um, there is a module in the admin software for asset management. So if we take what we have from the auditors as kind of the starting point and start to enter it in, um, it has kind of the formulas for depreciation. Um, and what other, Ellen Ring, you've gone into the module. What, what other? So, uh, Amory, did you just say there is, a, there, there is a function for depreciation in there? There is. Okay. Yeah. And would you would you have the ability to download your own Excel uh, from the list and put yeah. your own regression rates in there? You can set up a depreciation schedule. Um, do straight line. This needs another useful life. Particular. So we can set up assets in this module by department. We have the ability to transfer between departments for dispose of assets. Track where the asset, what expense account the asset, the date, of course the amount, and uh, any vehicle mileage if it's in fact is a vehicle asset we're tracking. How are things like City Hall or, or the streets department buildings and things like that are, are inventoried or are they? 
for example. The, we have this course on our schedule and we adjust the value, both the building and then the content separately. If uh, items are purchased that need to be insurance policy and that cost. But what, one of the things we might want to do with buildings is um, as we enter them, it have some sort of an assessment, you know, because you've got the, the building, but then you also have the roof and the HVAC and the, um, you know, the, the systems of the building. And, and that, um, you know, we need to look at you know, the, obviously the life of a roof is less than the life of the building and, and things like that. So, um, so there will be probably more work and we may need to, to, to have, you know, a, a, somebody with more expertise come in to help us get those systems set up. And then how about like pro undeveloped property that the city has? Uh, I assume we still have a little bit. We do have a, well, we, we're part owners of the Jones Farm, so that's something. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how how the asset inventory deals with that. It, it probably depends on if it's something that we would look to use in the future, or if it's something, you know, like we've got the Tennessee Avenue lots that we're selling, which that's kind of different than if we had land that we were planning to use for municipal purpose. Well, just, just, to, I mean, obviously real property doesn't depreciate. So right. it would be in a different, a different kind of schedule, but um, years ago, and this is all part of my valedictory, right? Um, years ago, <laughs> Ellen Lorraine uh, took on the daunting task of creating an inventory of the city's real property holdings um, it, it was never advertised as, uh, as 100% inclusive. Um, it was, it was a best, a best estimate. Um, that inventory hasn't been updated in a long time and it probably should be because for example, as Anne-Marie just said that the Tennessee Avenue lots are probably going to go out from that list and hopefully, and the, um, but we, realized that we had the property that the um, uh, swing bridge is about to largely encumber and that needs to be added on. Uh, ditto, it would be nice to have with respect to the city's real property holdings, um, a link to in one place to all of the city's MOUs with various nonprofits. For example, the city has an MOU with the Overfalls uh, that allows the Overfalls to use a portion of, of uh, Canal Front Park. Uh, we have a very long-term lease with the library that allows the library to use um, city property uh, over where the library is, is situated. So it'd be nice to, it'd be nice to have an up-to-date list of the real property and right there available, a list of all the uh, restrictions. For example, with the Jones Farm, we own as tenants in common, if I remember correctly, an undivided part of real property with two other owners, which obviously has its own um, uh, quirks. So, um, you know, I, I think it'd be nice if all that was centralized somewhere because the, the, the demands on the city uh, and Parks and Rec has been grappling with this. Uh, Andrew can probably speak to that much better than I, but uh, they're, 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 they're quite a number of people who have wonderful ideas about what they want the city to do with city things like city parks. Um, and we have to keep an eye on that to make sure we don't end up with lots of uses uh, other than, you know, enjoyment of open space. So, but I think that'd be a, that'd be a great thing to take on. Bonnie, to, to address the issue of things like leases, um, uh, we, Starting with this fiscal year that starts today, we have funded the um, property file cabinet through our electronic filing. And so our, our first 
priority. So we have an appointment next week to, for the, the, the guy to come in and get us set up. And um, the first priorities are scanning the licenses, the leases, the, the types of leases that you talked about, and then the canal front leases. Um, then, you know, it, again, this is going to be a, a momentous undertaking. Um, and then we'll look at getting all of the beach 99 year leases in, um, building permits. You know, we can easily get new lease extensions in at, as they're done, but kind of going backwards is going to take time. Same with building permits. We can get new building permits in, um, but it's going to take time. Same, and, and, and then development applications and, and board of adjustment applications. So all of these things will be in that, that um, electronic filing system. And when we set it up, one of the things that um, Janine and I have talked about is setting it up so that when you index it, we need to make sure that the fields are um, what we need to be able to then pull an Excel spreadsheet that queries, you know, that we could do um, property leases or license agreements. Um, we can put if there's things with expiration dates, what the expiration date is in the field so that we can start to, to, to pull those things and have, have them in a spreadsheet form. And then anything that has a parcel ID number that you can put in a spreadsheet can also then be mapped. We can link it with the GIS. So um, once we get this, this, this um, file cabinet, virtual file cabinet set up and start populating it, we will pretty much be able to pull reports that have exactly what you're suggesting. And this accounting software, you're able to attach those documents to assets to property by the tax map and parcel number. Any questions on that? I think as a tool, I think it'd be extremely useful for the city. One, to just know what we have, but two, for planning on bigger capital projects, et cetera. It's just, I think it'll help a long-term planning. It sounds like it's flexible too. It, it gives a standard uh, regression rate and then you can create your own, you can put in your own model. All right. Um, there's no more questions on that. That I wanted to move on to what's listed um, as C5, which is the um, we're calling revenue opportunities, fees, tax rates. If anyone had ideas on on new sources, um, I know that part of the packet that was sent around had a list of some of these sources. But you know, rather than go through those one by one. Um, I thought maybe we would just attack maybe the broader ones in that let that were kind of mentioned in the letter, for example. Um, and the first one, frankly, was is the tax rate. Um, so as you mentioned, it's not been raised since 2011. Um, I don't know, Amber, if you just want to make a, maybe a general comment on how Lewis compares in both our fee structures and our and our taxes to other municipalities, maybe that would be helpful. Just contextualize what Lewis is. So we can look at that. We haven't looked that closely at that, um, except in, in a number of, of smaller categories. One of the things that, that makes it challenging to, to compare um, the tax rate is ours is based off of our city assessment from 2000. Others are using municipal assessments that are more current than that. And then some are using the county's assessment from 1974. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you, you can't just compare the tax rates because the rate is based on different things. Um, the other thing is that our rate is based on 50% of the assessed value. Some places have a, a lower rate, but it's on 100% of the assessed value. So um, we haven't looked at that type of comparison. Um, now, with all of the counties now mandated to do reassessment, 
we may see more municipalities using the county assessments. We don't um, know when that will happen, Henry. The county's assessment. We, it's it going to take a I long thought that time. Was an, is that was that uh, appeal decided? I didn't realize that it happened. It, so they came to an agreement rather than going. So I think there's a consent decree. Of and, and that mandates that um, that's who pays for it. All of us? No, I mean, it's a serious question because reassessments are expensive. No, I mean, I, I think the counties are going to have to pay for it. So it's going to be all of us. Well, it, it strikes me that if we're about to have, um, assuming we agree with the methodology and the quality of the reassessment, um, if we're about to have a reassessment, then, and it's, it's uh, valuable, it's, it's, it's trustworthy, then that would be an opportunity for the, for the city to update its, its own records. Now, and then you're gonna have to figure out, you know, typically when real property gets reassessed by uh, government entities, the values go up, but the rate goes down. Mm -hmm. So, because they're supposed to be, reassessments, are, as I understand it, are supposed to be revenue neutral, at least when they, on, on the whole, whole, on the whole, on absolutely. the whole, they're revenue not, neutral. Not on an right. indi individual parcel basis, absolutely. But right. they're supposed to be revenue neutral as to the governmental entity. So, um, you know, that, I, I think that's going to be um, an interesting exercise. And if you want to increase the rate at that juncture, um, you know, you're going to have some people screaming, probably a lot of people in Louisville screaming because their assessment is going to go up. You can fiddle with the percentage of the assessed value upon which you base the rate. You know, that's the other variable, I guess. But, but if their assessment has just gone up and then the rate goes up, relatively speaking, um, it's gonna be a lot of unhappiness. The other thing that we've, we've talked about before is whether you change the rate for rentals, so charging a, diff a rate for short-term rental versus long long-term rentals, uh, and, and looking that as as a potential lever. Um, so typically, my understanding is that you don't change the rate, but you change the the way in which you value something that's a rental, and for something, it, and again. This is something you want to hear from an assessor, not somebody who has just been an observer of some of this. Is your your assessment can be based on um, if it's an income producing property, it can be based on the revenue associated with the the, the property. So um, some municipalities do assessments and that for their typical residential properties, it's assessed based on value, market value. And for the revenue producing properties, the assessment is based on the revenue generation. Well, I, I'd like to throw out something that's probably gonna cause a lot of consternation, but I'm gonna throw it out anyway, because I'm throwing myself out. So I might as well do all that at the same time. Um, in the conversations that we had on Monday concerning sea level rise and the future of properties in the floodplain. Um, the, not in the near term, but something the city really needs to start thinking about is eventually as sea level rise, you know, we, we can, you can only raise your, your houses so high. Um, so as, as sea level rise begins to take over certain areas or portions of areas, the city is gonna have to look at reducing the assessed value of those properties because they are going to become less valuable. And the long term, in the long term, that is going to erode the city's tax base significantly. So it's something that we're not going to be able, I don't think, to annex our way out of that. So it's something that the city really, in, in its, in, this is long range planning, but it's something. The other thing that came out of that bond, as you recall, is the idea of a, what they call it a resist. Resiliency fund, or was it, it was a, it was essentially a buyback fund. So here's here's my view on that, Andrew. I, I agree with you. That was something that was discussed. I find it obnoxious in the extreme that all of the tax fixers, payers of Lewis are going to be called upon or could be called upon to pay off the folly 
of people who live on the beach at this point with full knowledge of what is going to happen down there. Um, and I'll reiterate what I said before, which is the city needs a really, really good legal opinion uh, by an expert in this area as to what the city's liability or responsibility may be for buyouts or buybacks or retreat or anything else um, before we start setting up funds to pay for it. And that, but, but what you bring up to me goes hand in glove with the need to have an appropriate valuation of these properties. Because if, you know, if, if somebody comes to us in, in 20 years or 30 years or whatever the relevant time period may be and says, buy me out for the million dollars I invested in this property. And we, say, we need to have a basis to say to them, that is not the value of your property anymore. You chose to, to build in a floodplain. The value of your property has diminished. We have recognized that through our own taxation approach and the fair market value of your property is not what you're claiming. Bonnie, I think one, one idea might be to set aside like a, uh, a buyback zone as a separate taxable area of the city where the people in that zone are taxed at a higher rate to set up a fund to reimburse some of them should their properties become unusable or whatever, but that in effect, they would be funding their own ultimate buyout as almost like an insurance policy. That's a fascinating and, idea. Yeah. I, 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 I like that idea a lot. And, then, um, and frankly, it's easier to attach because most of those owners are leased, they're, they're lease owners rather than owning a property. And, and this would also serve to diminish the value of the properties because people would perceive them as having a, a much higher tax liability and a much higher liability of likely going away someday. So. I, I'd be curious to know- well, I think those uh, are all uh, wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> Go ahead, Jim. I was gonna say, I think they're all wonderful ideas, um, but the assessment and the sea level rise to affect those homes, um, probably we won't have to deal with them particularly the latter in our lifetime. So I would suggest maybe we talk a little bit more about things that will happen um, sooner than later. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think it's gonna be a long time before Bayfront property values are gonna decline. Just take a look at the, you know, what's happening in, in the city of Lewis right now. I mean, yeah, I mean, Lewis Beach is, is getting a little smaller, but, you know, I, I would I would suggest it's not that much different than it's been quite a number of years ago. So one day probably is something to consider strongly, but, you know, right now, personally, I, I would be in favor of taking a look at you know, a different tax rate for second homes or a different tax rate for investment or maybe even a different tax rate for um, commercial property and incentive, incentivize primary residences. Just a thought, just to get uh, conversation moving. And has that, is there, does anyone know, Anne-Marie, do you know if there's precedent to that where coastal communities are essentially giving a different tax rate to non-year round residents? Oh, I think you're on mute. I haven't seen different tax rates. I've seen things like added taxes, um, you know, similar to, we have the, the gross receipts rental tax. Um, and that is applied to short and long term. You know, some places have a higher tax on the, the short term rentals. Um, I think Fenwick Island also has a gross receipts rental tax on commercial properties um, for rental of commercial properties. And um, most of the, the other beach towns do have an accommodations tax. Um, for um, hotels, motels, and such. So we, um, 
we don't. We did get the, the charter authorization to do that. And then the pandemic hit. Rehoboth put their, um, Rehoboth and Dewey also just got that same charter authorization for the, the accommodations tax. And Rehoboth put theirs in just before the pandemic. Sussex County also got a, a they don't have a charter, but in their code, they got the code authorization from the state for um, an accommodations tax in unincorporated areas. And they put it in place just before the pandemic. And then they lifted it because of the pandemic, because the, the hospitality properties were already suffering. So by adding a tax, you know, so, so now probably isn't the right time, but that is the tax that, that we don't have. Um, I haven't seen different tax rates, but I can talk to the other managers to see um, what types of things they have. I've I mean, I know probably it may not be legal in Delaware, um, but I do I, know that they have similar things like that in um, like in Hawaii and in Florida. Um, South Carolina has different tax structures and they're all, you know, resort areas. So right. not and, saying and I it think can you're go right, here. Ben, I'm not sure it is legal in Delaware, which is why I think they have different types of taxes, but I will check. Yeah, and it might not be right for here, but I think, you know, Andrew's uh, edict was to uh, brainstorm. So just throwing a, something out there that, you know, obviously since revenues from from real estate tax is our biggest source of revenue that uh you know maybe that is an area to look um at possible increasing well one thing oh go ahead go ahead Marilyn. so um having had a little bit of experience in this in a in a prior time in my life um what i was going to say is if you're going to differentiate different types of owners you you have to make an assumption that there will be a tax appeal. And so to Bonnie's point, before you get too deep into the planning, into constructing <coughs> different tax rates, get to the attorneys first to find out where you stand because you don't wanna be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal costs justifying or trying to work through an appeal process. And um, it's happened in my lifetime, not in Lewis, but in another municipality. Um, the other thing I was going to say is what um, uh, Emory was referring to with commercial property is highest and best use. So when you're looking at appraising, you know, you can look at it as a real estate value or you can look at it as a revenue stream and discounting that back. And that could be used in a number of different ways for setting taxes for donation purposes, uh, for preservation purposes, et cetera. And so, you know, th these are some things that should be considered in the financial guidelines. And to Bonnie's point, what she was talking about, whether climate change is a decade from now, a year from now, or generationally from now, I, I think that all goes under the guise of having really good advice from um, uh, from a legal standpoint, from a tax appeal standpoint, and knowing where we stand before we ever get too deep into any of this. I think that, that's a great idea. Agreed. Within the BPW, we try, we serve the ready to serve charge to everybody. Uh, that is basically the tax on people who want here. Uh, you know, during, during the winter months, it's not that popular, but it is a structure that, that I think probably benefits the residents of Lewis a, a great deal. I think your points around the legal aspects are, are spot on. You can lose a lot of revenue in lawsuits. Um, I think I, I give Jim a lot of credit for mentioning the, the businesses. Uh, I'm personally not in favor of taxing businesses that much uh, because I believe Second Street is critically important to him. And Jim has two businesses on, on that street. So that's very nice of him to say that. Um, but I, I do think we need to make sure that we keep Second Street the way that it is and, and not too much on, on them as, as it relates to that. Uh, there are a lot of different structures in a lot of different cities. Some, and again, it may not be legal here, but I wonder if there's a trigger event when somebody moves in to reassess their property or their, their property rents in at, at a higher level. Um, 
if you look at some of these different situations, you, you have to almost figure out what your policy is. What, do you, what are you trying to do when you're trying not to tax? And I think businesses is bad. I think people coming in is, is a good thing to tax. You want to limit some of that to a certain degree. We came here and our taxes here are, are less for the full year than we were paying on an individual month in other places that we live. Right. It is, and I, and I get, we don't want to charge certain people higher rates, but anybody that moves here is moving right. to a large part because of the tax base. And that's, that's an advantage they have. I think when we look at building permits, we should charge a lot more for people who are building. And I know we've got the structure with the, with the different size of, of the house. Nobody looks at that. Nobody looks at that when they're building a house because the cost of the house is so much higher than that. So I, I think there's opportunities to push some of these positions. And I think the legal aspect of it is certainly needed. Yeah, can I just say, I, I agree with you that our taxes are very modest. Um, that's absolutely true, but again, before you raise people's taxes, you have to decide what you need the revenue for. Is raising taxes just raise taxes yeah. is not a good idea. I'd also, you know, I don't know, I'm sure everybody on this call is, is worried because um, of that over $400,000 a year uh, limit. You know, I'm certainly worried it's, it's gonna affect me directly uh, in the Biden bill. But more to the point, that was a joke, but more to the point, um, there was, as I think most people know, a um, bill in the Delaware legislature uh, to make Delaware state taxes far more progressive, which they need to be, frankly. Um, that particular bill, which would have taken the top rate, and I forget the numbers, but it would have taken the top rate, I think over 8%, although I, I may be misremembering. Uh, it didn't make it out of committee, but um, a revision at the state level also is probably um, inevitable. So it's just one thing to think yeah. about when you think about the whole total tax package in Lewis. Right. And Bonnie, you know, that's a great point based on the, the budget and the, the, our financial results. You know, we're, you guys are doing a great job. So, you know, do we really need a revenue increase? I don't know, but, you know, I think Andrew tasked us with coming up for some potential ideas and uh, you know I'm not sure anyone's proposing or a huge proponent of a tax increase but you know just something to maybe consider um, someday. Earl's comments about permits and licenses and I didn't have a chance to look at the fee schedule and see anything that was you know glaringly low or high um, in that mat bucket. I think um, I, I've I heard similar that. comments to Earl. That's a lot of our license fees are just fairly low. Um, but. I just think there's a lot of elasticity in that particular arena. Uh, if we needed to raise revenues, that that would be a lot of do it. It's fairly benign. So, you know, to Jim's point about look, moving the conversation forward, I think we've had some conversation on this and rather than brainstorms, why don't we agree to next time we'll frame out here, here are some areas that we may look to maintain, raise, et cetera. And um, we'll get some more meat on it. So if there are things that we feel should be um, referred to council or, or recommended to council, then we'll, we'll be in that position. I think today point was just around, you know, general thoughts, um, where we are as a city, do we need to raise additional revenue uh, and where, where could we do that? Um, anything else? That, yeah, go ahead, Bonnie. I, I just want to add one thing. Um, uh, there was a financial strategies working group a number of years ago. And one of the things that we had in there was a whole section on potential uh, additional sources of revenue. So Andrew, I'll send you that document if you don't have it, um, okay. because it, it, it was a study of, of just this issue. Um, so the last thing is, and um, before we get there, I know Jim's probably got to duck off at some point, but um, yeah, I'm going to have to jump off. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So I, I appreciate. Um, but we were going to get into um, the idea of what's scheduling next meetings. And I, um, Anne Maria had, I, I think, it, I don't know if Ellen Lorraine was in that meeting as well, but we, we discussed maybe the, uh, the idea of meeting more frequently as a group, not every month necessarily, but do you all have as a bandwidth think it's a, or, or is it a good idea to meet more than quarterly? Um, and the reason this came up because I think that, 
it would have been good to tap into the, this committee as we were in the budget drafting period and have your feedbacks there. So, you know, the idea was maybe we look to front, you know, backload, maybe have more frequent meetings as we're in sort of the budget planning process or, or what have you, or maybe we think of an idea to Bonnie's point where we have subcommittees that are specifically looking at the strategic piece. So just, just have a thought on that. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone makes a comment on, on that idea. I think this time we'll plan a meeting next quarter, but um, it, it, you know, as we develop as a group, I think let's look at that, whether we do wanna have the appetite for meeting more frequently. So the last thing on the agenda then was uh, capital projects. Do, are there, do, do you have anything to go through on that, Anne-Marie? Um, just a, a couple. See you, everybody. See you, Jim. Hi, right, thanks. Hi, Jim, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. We um, are wrapping up the Coleman 4th Street, um, which is our, our called Phase 24, um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's been a bit of a nightmare project, and it's almost over. Um, the other pieces of that that we added onto the contract are the um, ADA ramps and crosswalks at Adams, Manila, King, and also at Cedar and Savannah, um, because so many people cross to, to go to two dips um, and there's no safe crossing. So we're putting a, a crosswalk there. Um, so that that is wrapping up in terms of the, the coming fiscal year, um, or the, I guess, the new fiscal year that starts today, we have um, the Margaret H. Rollins um, community center, meeting room, restrooms, which the bid opening was this week. Um, because construction's going like gangbusters, well, that, that's my the reason I think it is, the, the bids came in well above what we had um, had estimated through GMB. Um, the low bid was at $289,512. We will be taking the recommendation to mayor and council to, to get started on that on um, April 12th. And um, we are going to be recommending, and I'm doing a little bit of legwork, but based on the indications I have at the moment, we're gonna be recommending that the city use the um, America, hold on, American Rescue Plan Act funding that we're going to be getting from the federal government for that. Um, it, 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 I think is um, very much connected to COVID because in order for us to safely resume in-person meetings, we need more space. We can't do that safely in, in council chambers. So we are also um, gonna be in, this isn't a capital project, but just so everybody knows, we're gonna be installing the um, streaming equipment and software in the Rollins Center meeting room so that um, when we do resume in-person meetings, that we'll be able to do that. So hopefully, if all goes well with construction and and the pandemic, hopefully by um, mid to late July, um, maybe August, we could start resuming some in-person meetings um, and and streaming them. Um, so that's one project. We also have um, a, a project. We have right now. GMB is doing what we're calling a programming investigation for the police department. And that will then, and that involves them talking to the stakeholders to say what, what functions do we need? What utility do we need in this building? And then um, the, then they'll begin the, the schematic sketches and, and um, hopefully, if not this fiscal year next year, we will make some renovations to the police department. If you have not toured the police department, it is in great need of, of improvement. So, um, but we also, we also worry that if they're on the verge of outgrowing the space, how do you, you know, making sure that we don't put investments in that, that aren't thinking about the long-term. So that's the, the reason for the programming. We are going to be getting underway with the design work for repaving Ship Carpenter Square. 
in the next fiscal year. So that'll happen probably in the in the fall or the spring. And then we're going to be working on the design for um, a rebuild of Railroad Avenue and the segment of um, Adams Avenue from from Railroad to King. Um, so that that will also be a, a project in this fiscal year. We are going to be redoing the tennis, pickleball, basketball courts at Canal Front Park. And um, at this point, council approved the bids, but then there was some concern about the surfacing that we've um, that, that is part of what we have in the bid. Um, so that is going to come back to mayor and council on April 12th for reconsideration. Um, I think those are, are the major capital projects. Oh, Lorraine, am I missing anything? Uh, playground. Oh, the playground, yep. Mm -hmm. Playground, phase two of the playground at, at George H.P. Smith Park. So Janet's working on that. Um, mm -hmm. so. Hey, Marie, as it relates to BPW's uh, uh, lease in, in, your, in your building there, I, I know you guys have added some people and taken some space. Is there any kind of trigger event that we need to start looking at as far as possibly moving out of that location? That, that question's come up a few times. And um, I, at this point, the discussion that council has had is that really the city has the ability to do some expansion um, by converting council chambers to offices and or conference room area. Um, so we don't anticipate that being something in in the, the five to ten year horizon unless the, the board would want to move out. I personally ha have shared with both Press and Darren when that question has come up that I think that there is value to us being in the same building because we're able to, to more easily work together. And um, we absolutely agree. With you. And I, I worry that with um, physical distance comes communication breakdowns. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. <laughs> All right, thank you. So coming to a close here, I think just to, just to kind of wrap up and for what I'll hope to provide by next meeting. So I think we had a good discussion on the, on the policy. Um, so hopefully by next meeting, we can have a a rough draft of you know, what we're going to call, I guess, guidance rather than, than policy, which I think is a better way to sort of phrase it. Um, and then it sounds like we're also in good ish position with the asset management. So um, I think we talked about what, what else we could add into what the software is already pulling. Um, and then the, the piece around the revenue increases, I think what, I, what I'd like to do there is maybe take what, what, what I gathered from this meeting, look at some of the, as you know, we discussed, where it, it may be appropriate to raise things and send around a discussion document. Um, and then I'll maybe we'll follow up with each of you individually prior to next meeting um, and then use that as our discussion point and see if there are any things that we, as a committee, might recommend to, to Mayor and Council to increase or not or or to include new line items but that that's that's my plan uh for prepping us for our next meeting so that we have something more uh tangible to kind of build off of um before we wrap up i did want to again so salute uh bonnie and thank her for all the guidance that she's provided me and the obviously to the city uh in her tenure and um you'll be sorely missed particularly from this committee you're very diligent uh, and your examinations, and um, I, I appreciate everything that you've done, particularly for me. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Um, and I just want to thank all the members of the committee. Um, you all have really done a service to your fellow citizens, and under Andrew's guidance and leadership, I think you're going to do great things. So um, please, uh, so thanks for your, uh, for your civic involvement. I've enjoyed it. Great. Well, thanks, Bonnie. And I think in terms of just scheduling a next meeting, I know we I brought up the idea of meeting more frequently, but because that was an, also a new thing to consider for you all, let's stick with our, our quarterly, which would 
which would put us what Jan, uh, essentially July one. Is that is that fall making us fall into that, Fourth of July holiday time frame? Or what are we looking it, at? There? It, well, there's that, but there's also um, even if we keep it quarterly, if you recall, we did talk about the benefit of potentially meeting after the council meeting so that yes. we have the benefit of the most current financial reports. Okay, so let's so set if, let's if set met, it based on that. The you wanna... 15th would be the Thursday. Okay, is anyone at this point is far enough out, I assume uh, if anyone has vacation already booked or what have you on the, the week of the fourth, actually the, the 15th itself then would be uh, the date, does that, find, does that work? What time, Andrew? What time? I think we we normally meet at ten. Uh, I, I I think we made this for nine thirty, maybe as an accommodation for Jim. I think he knew he had something, but I can't recall. But is that the case? We usually do meet at ten. I thought. I'm, well, I'm does, ha I mean, you you guys does, tell me. I mean, I'm I, I'm up at six thirty uh, every morning, so you know. Doesn't he have retail shops? This, right. Right. Yeah. So, so I if think. We did, we need to err to the side of going yeah, early. Earlier. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, is, is, is nine okay? Nine, is 9.30? I have no preference. I'm okay. Why, why don't we call it nine? That way, I mean, you know, it just gives Jim a little bit of yeah. extra time. So, and then we'll have, um, at that point, also a new council person, either newly elected or, or new in the sense of <laughs> new to the role. Right. All right. Well, again, um, I appreciate everyone's input. And um, like I said, I think uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, like some of it was just conversation around the, you know, the, um, the revenue pieces. So let's, as I said, I'll put something more tangible as a discussion document that we can move forward and maybe come up with some recommendations, hopefully coming out of our July meeting. All right, folks. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Andrew, if it would be helpful, I can send you a copy of, of some of our stuff that we've done as far as reserves and also investment policies as well. So you can take a look. Makes, yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, be um, one, one other thing is, uh, you know, we bought this house in New Hampshire and the, the, the town of Sandwich, which is where we're located, puts out a, a, a hard copy annual report. And I gave it to Anne-Marie and it has a very interesting section on how they... Uh, do set asides not unlike what the BPW does, how they do set asides for um, anticipated capital. It's an interesting document period, but for anticipated capital uh, outlays, mm. uh, you can just get a, an idea of how one other, at least one other town does it. I, I also recommend the hardbound annual report. I found it um, really helpful, which Anne-Marie I think agrees with. But um, Yeah, it, it, it's actually, so they have, I, I looked it up, um, I looked it up online and their, their population is a, about half of, of our population. Yep. So they're, you know, geographically much larger, but population wise much smaller. And it is very professionally done and well done. I, and if it's something that, that council is interested in the expense to do, I think it would be a, a great asset. Earl, if you bought a house there, you'd be the Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> That's <not possible. laughs> I, I was just going to mention that old people like hardbound books <laughs> with big print. Yeah. Eleven-year-olds do too. They leave them all over the house. <laughs> well, I appreciate everyone's time and uh, look look forward to and and feel free. I've I've said this before, but hopefully all of you have my number and feel feel free to reach out anytime by phone or email and you know. I tell this to all the constituents. If I if I'm available, I'll answer it. Otherwise, I'll call you back later. So okay. All right. Great. Thanks. All the best. Have Bye -bye. a good rest of the day. Happy Easter to everybody. Bye. Thanks.